we will read Psalm 103, Psalm 103, that's on page 594 in your pew Bible, page 594, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers, who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And O how all God's people would say, amen. So today we gather on the last day of the year, and I don't remember the last time that Sunday fell on New Year's Eve, so I'm excited because, as you know from past experience, I really like to visit the Wesley Covenant prayer every year at the beginning of the year. I personally prefer to do it on New Year's Eve as a way of setting the tone for the new coming year. And so I'm excited that we get to do this today on the last day of the year. As we reflect on this prayer that we will pray together before we're finished in this time of our worship, it's important to keep in mind that It is not only a tradition in the Wesleyan covenant or in our history as Methodists, it's also really a tradition that goes all the way back. The people of God are covenant people. God makes covenants with God's people. And as you probably have guessed, God never fails to keep God's part of the covenant. It's always the people who break the terms of the covenant. Maybe the word covenant is troubling to you because we use it in other contexts where we have hard feelings about it. I know for one uh, that, that it seems like at least once a year, someplace where they have a HOA covenant, right? A homeowner's association agreement. There's always bitterness around that covenant for somebody, <laughs> And so we hear the word covenant and it bothers us because, well, the fact is, is when people make covenants with each other, people bring their very flawed nature into the covenant. 
When I do weddings here in the sanctuary, it's very important to me that we stand before the altar and agree that while the couple is making covenant with each other, they're also making a covenant with God. And God never breaks God's covenants. God always upholds God's part of a covenant, which means that when you are struggling in your marriage, for example, and and uh, you're tempted to break that covenant that you made with each other, I hopefully have forced you to consider the possibility that you would be breaking covenant with God and God never gave you justification. There's the thing. When we break covenant with God, we're betraying God. And it's important to see it that way. It's important to take it as hard as that because you will never find justification for breaking covenant with God and as far as God's part is concerned. God never fails to keep God's covenant. So throughout Scripture, there is a consistent part that God plays in making covenants with God's people. And then we get into the New Testament covenant, and it is made through Jesus' own blood, which we will talk about momentarily at the Lord's table. And once again, Jesus will not give us cause to break the covenant. So we want to think about that for a minute. We want to think seriously about keeping covenant. Covenant is a word that means promise. It means a promise. It means I promise. And I, you know, it's an oath. It's, it's, a, it's a pledge, you know. Um, it's like a contract, but more important than a contract because a contract is a legal uh, document where a covenant is, is a dedication of your very soul. You know, it's a dedication of souls. It's something that is eternal in nature. And so we don't want to use the word lightly. So then if we enter this covenant prayer in a few minutes, it's good for us to keep in mind the seriousness of the pledge. It occurred to me as I was talking with uh, Emily on Wednesday about preparing for today's worship service that, that this covenant would be something on the order of signing the Declaration of Independence. All of those signers were in effect signing their own death warrant because should the revolution fail, they had a document with their signatures on it stating plainly their intentions. And therefore, should they fail, they would have been taken to the gallows. Now that's serious. No wonder then we give Mr. Hancock so much credit because he wrote nice and big. He wanted everybody to know his level of commitment. Well, that really is accurate in its comprehension of the idea of covenant, but it does fall short in a way. So I'd like you to think about the words you're going to say in a few minutes as though they will be heard in heaven because they will. In fact, the covenant prayer says, let this be ratified in heaven. So imagine then that you are stating for the record in heaven next to your column in the Lord's book of life, there will be a record of your statement of these prayer, of this prayer and these words. Does that make it more serious to you? Consider this, everyone who speaks the words out loud with me will be heard by the person near them. And so we'll have to say to each other, I heard you say it. You heard me say it. I guess I've got to live up to this. See, I want you to pray this prayer with me, but I want you to pray it with a little bit of fear and a whole lot of reverence because I want to define this coming year in our Shiloh family according to this covenant. And what is the covenant? Well, simply put, it's a covenant to serve Christ above all else to be entirely dedicated to Jesus Christ. 
See, we've been dedicated to a lot of things over the years in church. And many of us have gone to church all our lives and we've been a part of churches that seem to be dedicated to something, but it wasn't always Jesus. They were dedicated to noodle dinners. They were dedicated to their building. Oh boy, a lot of church people worship their building. You know, and I've seen it all over the years, so I tend to be a tad cynical, and that's why I'm going to stop talking about that right now. Because the more important matter is to draw your attention to the fact that the only thing that matters in the life of a Christian is Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't say it unless you mean it. The only thing that matters in a Christian's life is Jesus Christ. Now, the next year could bring you pain. It could bring you suffering. It could bring you all sorts of bad things. And if you believe that the only thing that matters is Jesus Christ, it won't make the pain less painful or the suffering less difficult to bear, but it will add meaning to your experience that causes you to put all of these things in perspective. And that's what I think what separates the true Christian from the rest of the world, even a lot of so-called Christians, is perspective. If my eye is on Jesus Christ, his throne of glory, if my goal is to please him and live these words of covenant for his name's sake, then whatever I bear, I bear for his sake. Whatever I do that brings me a moment of glory or happiness or joy is for him and because of him. The song that you just heard so beautifully sung reminds us that this baby became the man who assured all of that, who as the son of God took upon himself a burden we could not bear. And because of taking that burden on himself, he has released us to live to the fullest extent that a son or daughter of God can live. And so it gives us an eternal perspective. And this is the covenant then that we make, the covenant to live as sons and daughters of God. Not for our physical pleasure, not for our temporary successes or temporary comforts. I was talking with Anthony before church and he's asking me about my Christmas. And I said, well, it was peaceful because it was pretty uneventful. And then it occurred to me that, you know, go through those periods when it's insanity. <laughs> and when it's over, you're kind of relieved. And then after a while, you get to that point where you can just kind of take Christmas on your own terms, and then Christmas makes you lonely. Then Christmas becomes a time for sorrow and loneliness. And that's the problem, isn't it? Everything in life is so temporary. And so when we make a permanent covenant with Christ, we're looking at our lives intentionally as though the changing nature of physical life is not what it's all about, but rather the eternal nature of your soul, which was guaranteed because of Christ. So I invite you to join me in saying the words of the covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. Now, if you say these words out loud with me, mean it. Mean it. It will be on the screen. It's also going to be available in your hymnal at number 607. If you're not ready to pray this prayer out loud, don't. Don't. Because, because before we pray this prayer, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come into our midst with the steno pad and pen to make note of our prayer. And as we pray this prayer, let it be ratified in heaven as it is on earth. And if you're not ready to pray this prayer, that's okay, because you can come back to it. It'll still be in your hymnal at number 607, and 
By the way, you can Google Wesley Covenant Prayer and you'll find a number of versions, uh, not the different words, but different presentations of it. And so you can come back to it when you're ready, but pray it out loud. Let your own ears hear your voice. Say the words. If you want to read through it before you say it, I certainly understand. And that's part of the reason I'm kind of stalling right now is to give you a chance to look it over. But it has always been a tradition of mine for many, many, many years now to pray this prayer and to invite anyone who will to pray it with me. Are you ready? Let's say it out loud if we're ready. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Amen.